Thank you so much, uh, guys, for coming to this session. Um, it's a, a topic that's very dear to me, so I'm glad to see so many people attending. Um, and it's a very relevant topic that um, we're facing in society right now. So we're going to talk about uh, various aspects uh, in the subject area. So what my goal is to um, talk about how to use AI and Java to train your applications to recognize people. So it's not just recognize somebody like, OK, there's uh, person X. It'll recognize a person, but doesn't know the name, that type of thing. So not just recognizing, but recognizing the person by name. So that's the, the different uh, scenarios I'm going to be taking you guys through to show you um, how to go about achieving that. So here's the agenda. First, uh, I'll talk why facial, I mean, face recognition is uh, important. Then we'll go into evolving approaches into face a uh, API. And when I say face API, just think in terms of uh, Azure, what we have to offer around that area. Um, then I'm going to do a, a demo. And this one will be using like an AI type of scenario. Then we'll get into another aspect that we hear a lot for artificial intelligence. It's beyond the um, AI that a lot of the public um, clouds have already optimized and gave, give us APIs um, to implement. Uh, this one involves you customizing, writing those uh, machine learning models and training um, and how to deploy that. So I'll do a demo on that. Then at the end, um, I don't know about you guys, but a lot of talks you go to at the end, you hear great stuff, but the question is, how can I get started today? How can I go home and recreate all of this? So um, to start with, um, I'd like to talk about different areas that um, we're using facial recognition, like different industries. So the very first picture you see is um, an incident about a month ago in China where um, a criminal was in pursuit. Somebody c committed a crime. The police were looking for them. So do you know what this clever guy went? <laughs> he went to a concert. And that's, for me, that's genius, because that's where a lot of people are going to be there. And he tried to blend in. But can you Im imagine, due to the technology of face detection, it was able to identify that person amongst like 60,000 attendees. So the police was able to actually go down the aisle, go exactly to where that s person was sitting, and apprehend that person. And all of this happened last month. So that's in the public sector. Another um, area um, I was uh, reading in the news uh, recently is for um, Christ, uh, no, Subaru. So for Subaru 2019, their SUV is going to uh, include a facial recognition. Uh, well, they already have one, but they're enhancing it. So what is it going to do? How many of you guys have driven anywhere kind of drowsy? Oh, wow, you guys are model citizens. <laughs> so um, what they're trying to do is recognize people, but kind of watch their... Facial, emo, uh, facial gestures, if it looks like they're distracted, because they could be distracted, uh, distracted, there's like a ton of things happening, especially for people that have family. If you take your eyes off the road for a while, you're going to hear uh, uh, an alert sound. 
Another benefit of this is, let's say I'm driving. Either I have a long distance um, trip that I need to drive, or I've just been out doing whatever. Most of us don't party, right? <laughs> but just in case um, you're out there, you're coming back, you had a long day, and you're drowsy, right? And you're kind of nodding off. This will alert you. So that's like the facial recognition, but kind of under facial recognition, it gives you other attributes, um, kind of like emotions and whatnot, or how your face um, is um, being construed. So um, another feature that they added is um, up to five people, they can recognize the images. So you know in a family, let's say a husband and wife um, share the same car, the husband will have their own settings, uh, especially like people with long uh, legs versus short legs. You know, you have to adjust like the mirror and whatnot. So let's say person A comes and has their perfect settings, then person B comes in and resets everything. So the good thing about this facial recognition technology, as soon as a driver hops into the seat, it's able to automatically adjust based upon this person's preferences. So those are examples of um, what's being used in technology. The, in the industry of uh, sports and technologies, if you notice, uh, like when you purchase tickets to a lot of these sporting events or uh, entertainment events, there's a disclaimer on the ticket that your photo may be taken, but of course we're all excited to attend the event. We don't pay attention. But there's a company out there in uh, South Africa that has uh, software that is selling to most of these entertainment arenas. So what they're doing is taking photos of us as we're entering the arenas. So at first it was like a cool social media thing that after the game, tag yourself. You know, if they show all the images and whatnot. You wanna show that, oh, I was at the event too, you tag yourself. Not knowing that um, a lot of these arenas need facial recognition, number one, who are the ones coming back very frequently? The next thing is how can we use uh, people's uh, demographic, so young, old, uh, depending, I, I know there's like a misconception, different sports maybe draw like a older or younger crowd, so that's type of thing. So using that for advertising, customizing for your audience. So those are some of the problems. So let's get back to facial recognition, how that's done. So with uh, facial recognition, the very first thing you need to take into consideration is in order for that technology to work, every human being we have different points on our faces that scientists have identified that those are key components to differentiate a one human being to another. So not only are these points there, you have to take into consideration that, okay, what's the distance between one eye to another? What's the depth? of the eye, where are the lips, you know, then the size of the lips, different uh, facial components like that. Then it kind of leads to where this um, talk is coming into place. What about aging? Because you have a photo of me when I was looking a certain way 10 years later, I'm the same person. But what if I've changed over time? Is it still gonna recognize who I am? Then in a short period of time, people gain weight, people lose weight. 
what about that? Are we taking those into consideration? Then the next thing is um, for us women, <laughs> we change our hair colors or you know, change our hair every other minute? Or you know, do people uh, grow facial hair or not? And a lot of situations you hear of um, when somebody is, um, we have a fugitive, they try to go into lanes to conceal themselves. But how can we train artificial intelligence to already know key attributes about a face to recognize in situations like that? So this comes to the very first area that I want to do a demo on. So Microsoft has a service called Face API. So with the Face API, can you see, guys see it? Yeah. So for the Face API, you notice the very first uh, method there under just face is detect. So first, when you're dealing with the image, you need to detect where the human face is. So that's the square um, bracket that you have there. Then you have an API if you want to find some simil similarities. Um, then one thing that's new is grouping. And that's the core of what today's talk is. So let's say you have all of us in a room right now, right? We're a group of people. And I want to train my model that in the future, I want to identify each person, but not each, just each person, but by name. How are we going to go about doing that? So what grouping does is the very first thing you do is create a group container, not like Kubernetes type of container, almost like a bucket of people, right? You have, you create a group. The next thing is you need to create a person. And that's a sub bucket of its own. So that sub bucket of person is going to be like Ruth. Another bucket will be John, because that's a separate individual. Then you add faces to each individual. So with uh, Microsoft right now, you can have up to, for one individual, you can have up to 248 images in there. Um, a total of, uh, if you're planning to add people, a total of a million people out there. So let's take a step back. Once you have all of those people in, you need to train your model that going forward, if somebody gives any image of myself, it should recognize, regardless of all the fluctuation, all the difference in my face that has changed over time, you have trained it already. So that's a very good thing about uh, this face model. So if you notice, um, when I put the resources out there, um, the group, if you use a group person, it's a grouping. But if you notice, it's like the smallest uh, type of grouping. You can have up to 1,000. So we recently added a large group. And that one you can have up to a million persons. So this is what I was talking about, the different constraints. So think of it like I have a whole bunch of images, which is taking a photo of you guys. But how can I group one person into groups? So let's um, put this into a demo so you guys will have a better understanding of what I'm talking about. So right now, we're under Eclipse. I'm not too loud, am I? <laughs> OK, so right now, we're under Eclipse. So I'm going to show you how this all works in real life um, to better appreciate. Um, 
So we're going to start uh, Eclipse. Uh, I'm using Spring Boot. Um, then I have Rest Calls. Um, then these Rest Calls are calling services that um, actually call the API. So the very first thing you need to do is um, create a group. So we go to, uh, port 8080, then in order to add a group, I'll click on the link for person group and my REST API. That's the path I gave it to. So I'm going to call it um, DevOps Friends. OK? So I just created the group. So the ID of this big bucket group that you just created, this is very important. You need to store this information because in order to create anything that goes under this bucket, you need to um, use this later on. So the next thing we're going to do is create uh, a person. So in order to create a person under that group, the next thing we need to do is call the person API. And this is the part that we're saying, create a container for me to put all my people, a person in. And you're passing in the group name that you just um, created. So that's a person. So for this one, I'm going to call it Matt, because that's the name of the group. And later on, this will come into picture, because when we try to find this uh, image in the crowd, it'll come back and identify this name, because you already labeled it. So th that mat is also linked to a unique identifier. So we're going to store that information. So give me a few minutes. And we call it a mat. So let me prep my APIs. So when I call the subsequent APIs, it will be easier for us to use. OK, perfect. So the next thing, now that we have the group cre uh, created, we've created a container of a person. Um, we have the ID of the person. The next thing we need to do is start adding faces to this group. So. The next thing we're going to do is pass in all these parameters about a person and start adding faces to the person. So I'm going to call it Matt's face. And the good thing is we're almost done. OK, so I chose Matthew McConaughey. And the reason why I chose him is he's done a lot of movies where he's really morph. One minute he's lost a lot of weight, and the next minute um, he's gained weight or he's lost hair. So let's upload um, his images. So shouldn't take too long. Well, we have 15 images that it has to load. Perfect. So that's done. So once you have your images done, the next thing you need to do is train your image. 
So for this, uh, the purpose of the demo, I'm only gonna use one person. You can add multiple people at this point and still be able to, uh, to achieve um, what you're trying to do. So in order to train your model, you call the train API. Still spinning. Do you guys have questions uh, why we're waiting? I know we just came back from, <laughs> from lunch. How many features are expected from the page? How many features? That's a very good question. Um, I have one more slide that you see all the features that are extracted. So I think you're psychic. You're two steps ahead of me. <laughs> so we'll get there. So now that I've loaded all the images, the next thing you need to do is now train your uh, model to recognize all these faces. And one thing I want to stress about the training part, this is an asynchronous process. So depending on the number of faces, because mind you, I told you you can have up to a million. This could take a while. For me, Matthew McConaughey, I only selected 15 images. What if you had a whole slew of uh, individuals? So even though it's the asynchronous uh, process, there's also uh, API that you can call, ping it every now and then to check the status to see whether it's finished training. So it's not like you just shoot it out there and you're like, okay, I hope it comes back. There's, <laughs> there's a way to check to see whether um, your model has completed. So now to answer your question uh, about what type of uh, attributes are extracted, um, I'm going to call the identity function. So the identity function is one of the main functions it's outside of the grouping that um, if you have an image, you're just trying to find a match. So you can give it one to many um, and ask, okay, can you see if you find an identity? So with Matthew McConaughey, I uploaded individual images of him, right? So for this other one, I'm going to upload an image of him and somebody else, which is his, it's his wife, which we did not train. So the question is, how is the system going to respond to that? Is it still going to be able to identify Matthew McConaughey, um, given the different images that we have? Um, and be able to do a, a match on that. So it should be almost done uploading. So I want you to take a look on the right-hand side. These are all the images that we uploaded for Matthew McConaughey. If you see, they're diverse. Some he has facial hair, some he doesn't, some he has glasses, some he's uh, fluctuated in weight. So it's telling us here that Matt was found with this confidence level. And mind you, I only use 15 images. But as you know from machine learning, in order to get a more accurate um, um, training uh, result or training score, the more images that you upload, the better your probability of finding it. But anything between zero and one, and once the threshold is like 0.5 and above, you know that, yeah, this is a po positive match. Um, 1.7 is uh, nine is not bad, but yeah, given the data set, um, it's kind of 
is positive, but we can improve. Then answering your question. Number one, if you notice there are two people, right? What were the attributes that were returned when we try to do an identification? Like, you have an image, can you find an identity in this image? It's just looking at this image. Um, so it took this image, went through this, and asked, can you find a match? So if you notice the very first first ID, it has a unique name. It shows the number of candidates and the person ID that uh, it came up with. We can look it up. Um, that's Matthew McConaughey's uh, face when we uploaded it. And it gave us this confidence level that this is how much confident I am. But the question is, what about the person standing next to them? So you have another face ID because it detected another human being. But if you notice, it doesn't have any information because we didn't train that person. So that's another um, way of using grouping, training a face, than using identification. Then in terms of face detection, that's the question that you were asking. Anytime you call our detect API, it's going to detect that person, but it's going to come back with attributes. Um, the very first thing that you're seeing up here, the top, um, um, you know, that's like height, width, uh, face landscape, and whatnot. Those are different data points around the face. So easily when I had both couples there, you can use this quadrants over here to use the Java graphing to draw that line. That's what those coordinates are uh, for you. Because if we're to take this and graph it, it would have graphed the image of the person it saw and give it a name, Matthew McConaughey. But for this um, demo, I just want you guys to get a sense of that. Then let's look at some of the attributes that it found. Um, besides that, it sounds like it has a 99.99 uh, .99 confidence that he was smiling. Um, the head uh, pose um, wasn't generated it thinks it's a, fee, it's, it's a male. <laughs> um, it thinks his age is uh, uh, 46. Uh, facial hair. Uh, it ha he has a slim, low numbers for facial hair uh, in the image we just uh, uploaded. Glasses, it will show the emotion, is he angry? It looks like it's happy because all of these come up with zero. The happiness level is high. So we can do all of that um, and identify. Where you see a facial ID um, showing up again, that's for the woman in the picture. So for the woman, uh, we go through the coordinates, but what are her um, face attributes. Um, it identifies that she's is a female. It can tell its age, hair. Um, it doesn't really say anything. Huh? Everything is neutral. She's neither smiling or whatnot. But you guys get the gist. Um, one thing I want you guys to know from this is when you go to the API page, depending on what your business case is, you have a plethora of APIs that you can use to manipulate to meet your business needs. Because one thing that prompted me to have this conversation with you guys is we're all Java developers at our company. A lot of us don't have PhDs into uh, data science and whatnot. 
when you're faced with a problem, you're trying to come up with a solution, a quick to market type of thing. If you have um, uh, a solution that's already optimized and proven, why reinvent the wheel? You can use this and implement powerful solutions. So for Java developers, that's my first pitch. So my ne that kind of leads to the next dilemma before I get to, um, <laughs> to the next demo. So for artificial intelligence, another thing you guys hear a lot is deep learning. Deep learning is everything that we just did on the UI, throw out the window, <laughs> you need to code that from scratch and you need to know what you're doing. So that's where you hear frameworks like TensorFlow. How, and a lot of these uh, frameworks that are there, I'm not sure whether you guys can see it. Oh, I thought, oh yeah, I'm not even in presentation mode. Sorry about that. Okay. So one thing that uh, Microsoft has done for um, us trying, us developers in general, trying to solve a machine, a deep learning type of scenario is they created a machine right out of the box, a VM for you to start with. So when you provision the DSVM, which is data science VM, right out of the box, all of these are installed for you because it's meant for data scientists. What do data scientists work with? Uh, for languages, you have the Python, you have the R, C, Java, uh, platform, data platforms, uh, we gotta sometimes integrate with things like Spark, uh, Hadoop, uh, even like data sources. Then deep learning. Um, you have machine learning tools or AI tools like TensorFlow. This is uh, Microsoft's new machine learning. It's called uh, Microsoft Workbench and it's meant our proprietary uh, Microsoft uh, Machine Learning Studio. It's also great for people who are new to um, machine learning that can just sit there and code. This one is a drag and drop. You can still achieve all of this, but it's more of a graphical way. You bring in your data, cleanse it. The algorithms are listed right there. You plug in the algorithm. Um, if you need to score it, you just drag and drop the scoring model. If you need to uh, ev evaluate a model, you just drag and drop all those graphs. Everything is there for you. The only difference between that and the new, um, what's it called, uh, <clears throat> machine learning uh, workbench is for this one, uh, the other one is a pass service. For this one, you can deploy and run it locally. So you can share with your team. You can integrate um, with your IDEs. Um, when you run your models, you can even go back and look at um, prior runs. Because one thing about machine learning, as you're tweaking it, you may have gotten like an okay number that's good to go, but you're thinking, okay, maybe let me tweak it, but everything goes haywire, so you may want to go back to the one that was working. So that's a very good benefit of that. I apologize. That's a good benefit of that. That um, we have. Then you see all the frameworks, TensorFlow, uh, HTO, um, deep water, uh, sparkling water, then visualization. You know, you can do it via um, things like um, Excel or um, 
what's it called, Power BI. There are different uh, visualizations that you can use out there when you're done and you want to analyze your data. Then data ingestions, you have to uh, think of where your data is coming from and not just where your data is coming from. When you start thinking of this, think of how rapid, because some, it could be coming gradually. So it's something you can run in a batch-like situation. So you schedule it, and you have all the data in one place, you ran it. But what if it's coming faster and furious in real time? So that's when you start using stuff like Kafka or Event Hub. So start thinking of stuff like that before you start coding. Then development tools, uh, they speak for themselves. PyCharm, R, and uh, Visual Studio. So that's number one. So this kind of leads me to the next uh, problem that we Java developers face. For me, I've been coding in Java forever. But now with the evolution, the hype about uh, AI, a lot, I hear a lot of uh, fellow Java developers, do I need to learn yet another language? Do I need to learn uh, Python? Do I need to learn R? So what are the frameworks out there that support that, uh, the languages that we're already coding? So that kind of leads me to um, a good open source um, library that handles deep learning that we can leverage from. So when you're dealing with deep learning, you have to take into consideration deep learning, you deal with neural networks, and there are networks, and the, they're structured in a graphical way. And think of the data that you need in order to run this. You only, you're only sitting <laughs> at your desktop with one CPU. Yes, it's gonna run, I've tried that, but I had to wait for hours. So a lot of um, companies, you know, like uh, Microsoft, we also offer something called GPUs. These are like highly optimized um, processing, graphical uh, processing units for deep learning that you can run all of this and it runs fast. It already knows how to handle different structures like that. So log for <clears throat> deep learning for J supports GPUs. That's the very first thing you need to take into consideration. Then we're talking about facial recognitions, right? What model supports that? That's the next thing you need to figure out. So they have something called convolutional, convolution neural network. That's the image processing. So basically what it is, is it kind of, it was derived by how humans interpret images. And it went all the way to our brain, like when we see like maybe a vertical um, line, there's certain triggers that trigger, or horizontal line. So based upon that, they came up with a model to kind of emulate how the human brain works in order to train uh, machines to come about the same process. So that's one thing. In terms of when you're dealing with images, you use that model. The next thing is you're gonna have a whole bunch of pipelines of images coming in. For me, I have a small data set, so it doesn't matter. But what if you have a massive set of data points coming in? You can use um, um, Log4j, and it handles all of that. What about tuning, optimization, uh, performance? And this one, I provided a link, because I don't, that's a third party, 
but I provided the link. You guys can do your search because they do a good job publishing their benchmarks against all these popular deep learnings that we're used to. So one thing we do is once we hear something is, is popular, is a fad, we go running. You need to pause and do your research and figure out reasons why I need this. So that one I'll let you guys uh, do your reading and see the pros and cons of going some of the mainstream versus sticking within our Java. And not even, it's not even a language thing, it's a performance thing. Then every machine learning or artificial intelligence, when you're training something, at the end, when you apply the algorithm, you need to evaluate your model. And the evaluation, you see the score of it. And based upon the score, you know whether, okay, I just wasted my time. I didn't, you need to start all over. So the score would tell you how well your model came out um, after testing. Um, then you need a visualization uh, component of it, which um, uh, Deep Learning for J offers. Then the very crucial thing is, I just sat there in Eclipse or IntelliJ, coding all of that, right? When I'm down, what happens? It showed me that, okay, I came up with a, a good algorithm. Do we just shut our desk and just go uh, celebrate? No. There's a way for you to extract your models out there. So it has a way of you saving that model that you just create and calling it, whether it's in your Java application or let's say you have a mobile application. And that one, um, I know we have nine minutes, so I need to speed up. I'll quickly show you guys um, how that works. So we're gonna go to the Microsoft portal real quick, just to give you an idea of um, what a deep learning VM, when you deploy on Azure, how that looks. So the very first thing, um, when you're deploying, you just go to um, plus, AI, machine learning, and actually, hang on. You do a data science. Okay, so one thing to point out is even though we have like a, a VSVM. It's not just for Linux. You can use it for um, Windows. You can use it in different platforms. So um, the good thing is I already created my cluster. So we're going to log into um, the VM that I created. So once your VM is created, you just click on the connect, and this is a Windows, so I'm gonna use RDP um, to launch that server locally. And I'll enter my password. Bear with me. We're almost done. So many passwords to remember. Um, any questions so far? Okay, it's connecting. 
Okay. So remember how the other um, slide I mentioned that all of those stuff that those different blocks I was showing, the frameworks, the tooling, and whatnot that's already pre installed, when you log in, this is exactly how it's going to look like. But uh, in this case, I noticed that, okay, I'm going to be uh, coding in IntelliJ, or it could be Eclipse. So I went ahead and um, installed IntelliJ. So let's open that um, program real quick. Okay, I have five minutes left. So let me show you an example of a model, training a model will look like. So the very first thing we're doing is we're setting our settings. So if you understand uh, machine learning, uh, whether you are using TensorFlow and whatnot, some of these um, settings don't change. Um, they're conventions and uh, machine learning, uh, especially for deep learning algorithms. So you set your settings. The next thing you need to do is load your data. So you need to figure out where your data is coming from. For me, I'm going to be loading it internally. So I gave it a local drive where I have a whole uh, um, my celebrity data. Um, the next thing is once you load it, um, in machine learning, it's very wise that you have a whole bunch of data set. Um, you want to divide how much of it you want it to go into training and how much you want to reserve to do testing against. So I'm saying take 80% 80, 80 of my data for um, testing another 20% I mean, for training, another 20% um, for um, testing. Then the next thing is once you have that said and done, you need to open a data processing pipeline. So you need to bring this in. But your question is, I thought we just uploaded an uh, image up there. The, question, the difference here is, if you notice, we're specifying the height and um, the number of channels and the label makers because it's prepping your data. Because let's say for Matthew McConaughey, right? If you load a whole bunch of data and you're trying to later on do a match, it found a match, but there's a name missing. So. For what I did is those directories for each individual, I have directories. So it's loading those labels as the name of um, the person. Um, there are different strategies you can use for that. Uh, you can even extract that and store it in a database if you want to query. So that's number one. Number two is once you have that all said and done, both for your, for your training and your tests, you go into the part that is the uh, machine learning, the neural network. So um, for neural networks, how many of you guys are familiar with uh, neural networks? OK, about 70%. OK, that's awesome. So for neural networks, it's just they're a connection. You have your input but you have to process data. Outputs from that data, you feed it into the next uh, stage, and from there, you're uh, applying different uh, processing or algorithms in between. So that's what we're doing. We know we're going to be using the convolution uh, neural network, also known as um, the CNN. So what we're just saying is, like the different stages I was talking about, they call it layers. So you're just specifying for each layer what it should be doing. 
and um, for the first one, it's going to be convolution. Then what kind of um, activity, action it is. Um, due to the time, let me speed up. But you set up your neural network. You set up what your output is. You have to also think of uh, the data loss, the ones that did not um, just, just fell through the cracks. They're not usable, that sort of thing. Um, so once you create your neural network, um, you don't need to know the details of this. The code will be out, but I'm just showing you how simple it is to create a model. The next thing is you need to train your model. So you created the parameters and whatnot. Um, you need to set how many iterations are there are. Then this line is the one that's actually training your model. Once you're done, if you want to evaluate your model, you can go ahead and do that. If you want to spit out statistics about your, your model, you can do that. And that's sitting the score, because when you evaluate, the output is uh, showing the scores. You, so you can do that. One thing, other, um, like the tensor flows and whatnot, you have like graphics and whatnot. So the good thing about um, uh, deep learning for J is you do have the ability to plug in like graphs so you can look at the graphs and whatnot. But the final thing I want you guys to pay attention is um, the fact that when you run this, um, um, it's going to be um, exporting the train network. One last thing. Um, before we wrap up. Um, when you run this code on a local um, environment, it's going to be totally different. There's a setting you need to set for a GPU environment. OK, hang on. All of a sudden, OK. Goodness. Oh. Okay. So this is crucial. Anytime that you need to run your data in a GPU environment, there's another setting that I removed. Make sure you, it's called the ND4J. If you were doing it locally with one processor, a CPU, it's called NDJ4, then native something something. That's when you have like a CPU. But once you want it to process and take the benefits of running under a GPU environment, it's very crucial for you to change the, the setting. And that's all you need to do. Um, it looks like time's up, uh, but I just wanted to show you guys. Um, uh, as I'm wrapping up, I'll go ahead and run the, um, the application. So it won't be completely, <laughs> it won't be completely wasted Why I finish up and show you guys where to find some of these stuff. And also the source code model will also show you guys where to find um, some of this information. Um, let's see. Any questions? OK, so. If you want to get started, um, I'll suggest um, starting with a free Azure account. Um, the next thing you need to do is go to the Face API. And the good thing is for us Java developers, you can go to Maven and find SDKs. Um, 
You can find out about deep learning, so stuff like GPUs or VMs that support all of that. You can find it there. Um, if you want to find out what uh, deep learning for J is and why I recommend it for us Java development, uh, you can find that. Then also um, source code on some of the GitHub demos that I've done. Um, then other useful information. Thank you so much. <laughs> mm -hmm.